Hey everybody, I wanted to discuss membranes with you. And these are going to be made both of epithelial tissue and connective tissue. Uh, one type of membrane is a mucous membrane, and this type of membrane will, op uh, will line a passage that is open to the exterior of the body. Uh, and this does include your respiratory tract and your digestive tract. And I know that may be a little bit weird to wrap your head around, but it technically is open to the outside. So for example, don't cringe too much, but if you're going to stick a pipe cleaner down your throat, you could touch parts of your trachea, you could go down into your very small bronchioles uh, with that small pipe cleaner that you put into your mouth. So it technically is considered to be open to the exterior. Same idea with your digestive system. You could take a pipe cleaner, for example, and put it down your esophagus and touch the inner lining of your uh, of your stomach. And you do this sometimes. You do um, put a scope into different parts of your body so that you can observe any uh, pathological states. Uh, so these uh, digestive respiratory system are uh, lined with mucous membranes. These are considered open to the exterior. And there are three main parts. You have the epithelium, which will line the lumen, the lamina propria, which is the connective tissue directly underneath, and then the muscularis mucosa. So I'm going to skip ahead one slide and show you the picture of that. So this is a mucous membrane. You can see there's a decent amount of mucus being produced thanks to this goblet cell right here. Here is your epithelium. Here's your basement membrane right under it. And then deep to that, you have your lamina propria right here. And I know some of you were confused about the term lamina propria as it was labeled in your histology atlas in lab. Lamina propria is just a term for the connective tissue associated with epithelium in mucous membranes. And that's it. So lamina propria is the areolar connective tissue in mucous membranes. That's it. And then attached to your lamina propria, which is right here, you can see all those fibers, white blood cells around. Then you have your muscularis mucosa. So you have a little bit of smooth muscle down here. So three main sections, muscularis mucosa, here's your lamina propria, that's connective tissue, and then you have your epithelium up here. Um, and you see some cilia up here in, in some parts of some mucous membranes. So those are mucous membranes. I'm going to return. Serous membranes are going to line the insides of some body cavities, uh, and these are not going to be open to the exterior. So for example, uh, in your abdominal cavity, for example, um, lining uh, the, the pleura uh, outside of your lungs, for example, the pericardium outside of your heart, you cannot put a pipe cleaner in any of those membranes without uh, performing surgery, for example. You cannot go inside a hole of your body to, to touch any of those membranes. Uh, so these membranes are going to lie in parts of your body that are not open to the outside. Uh, and these structures, uh, you'll find simple squamous epithelium, so very thin epithelium, areolar connective tissue supporting it, and then also a little bit of smooth muscle usually. And these epithelial cells are also going to produce serous fluid to help reduce friction. This is going to be a watery kind of fluid um, that produces friction. So here's a picture. Here is your uh, simple squamous epithelium right here. And these are producing a little bit of serous fluid. Uh, so for example, your lungs and your heart are constantly expanding uh, and contracting as they're working and you do not want friction every time you take in a breath or every time your heart beats. So this serous fluid is going to help to lubricate these membranes uh, in your pericardial cavity, for example, um, and in your uh, pleural cavity in between those membranes, those serous membranes. Underneath these squamous cells, you can see a little bit of areolar tissue. Remember, epithelium always has to be supported by some type of connective tissue. And then below that, you see a little bit of smooth muscle. So that's serous membranes. And then there are a couple of other types of membranes that we see. The cutaneous membranes um, are how we classify our skin. These are very dry due to uh, keratinization, which consists of the cells uh, dying and being filled with a protein called keratin. And this consists of the epithelium, or your epidermis of your skin, that stratified squamous epithelium, and then the connective tissue in your dermis. Uh, so you've got areolar connective tissue in the papillary layer and um, dense irregular connective tissue in the reticular layer of the dermis. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next chapter.
Then you have synovial membranes, which will line joint cavities. We talked about this just a little bit in lab. These are made of connective tissue, and they're going to produce a synovial fluid, which is very slippery. So it's going to help reduce friction where your bones articulate in those, uh, in those joint cavities. And then finally, we have endothelium. Endothelium is a special term uh, that's used for the cells that line your heart and your blood vessels. It's made of simple squamous epithelium, uh, but it has a special name when you're looking at the heart and the blood vessels, endothelium. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how tissue grows, dies, and how it is repaired. There are different ways that tissues can grow. Hypertrophy is when you have an increase in individual cell sizes, so not mitosis, but you have a growth in the size of the cells that you already have. You see this in skeletal muscle and also in adipose connective tissue. So when you go to the gym a lot and you uh, bulk up your muscles, that is due to an increase in the size of the cells that you already have, not due to an increase in the number of cells. Hyperplasia is tissue growth due to increase in the number of your cells. So this is due to mitosis. You're increasing the number of cells. Uh, and usually when you're looking at tissue growth in most of the body, this is how tissues will grow in size due to hyperplasia. Atrophy is when you have shrinkage of a tissue due to a decrease in the size or in the number of cells. Uh, so a couple different types of atrophy. Senile atrophy is a shrinkage of tissue caused by aging. And then disuse atrophy is when you don't use the organ. And so um, it atrophies because that organ is not being used. When you need to repair tissue that has been damaged, there are two mechanisms for this. One is regeneration, and th this is just replacement of the cells that died, uh, of cells that are exactly the same. And so since you're replacing the old cells with new cells that are exactly the same, you're going to have normal function. Fibrosis uh, involves replacing those dead cells with scar tissue. And because these are not going to be the same cells that you had before, you're not going to have normal function restored to the area. When you're repairing your tissue, there are four main steps. The first is inflammation. Inflammation is generally not something that's, that's fun to happen to you, but it is a really important process. And the reason for this is because of this hyperemia that occurs. Increased blood flow. You're going to be bringing more blood to the area, you're bringing uh, more fluid to the area, and this involves bringing macrophages and antibodies and immune cells that can help get rid of any bacteria or other microbes that have gotten to the area. Clotting factors so that you can plug up that break in a blood vessel nutrients and oxygen to help with the regeneration of tissues. Um, you're potentially going to have a lot of mitosis and growth going on. Uh, very shortly you need plenty of nutrients um, to fuel that. Uh, other growth factors in order to fuel um, the mitosis that will go on. Healing uh, to that site, getting away, getting other um, the damaged tissue away. Chemicals that are released are going to influence this hyperemia. Uh, so, for example, we've talked about mast cells in areolar connective tissue release histamine. Histamine uh, is going to bring, it's going to increase blood flow to the area. It's going to increase inflammation. So, first step, inflammation, increased blood flow to the area, and all of those other goodies that come along with it. Second step is blood clot formation. This is going to help keep your wound closed so you don't continue to just slowly bleed out over time. This is also going to prevent the spread of pathogens into the healthy tissue. So here's a picture of what those look like. Uh, here you can see there's bleeding into the wound. Here's your break in your blood vessel right here. You can see this lady has cut her finger with that knife. So this blood vessel has opened up and now you have bleeding into the wound. So here's your stratified squamous epithelium of your epidermis, right? Here's your stratum base cell right there. Looks a little bit more cuboidal and you have all this blood going into your epidermis. This section is going to be your dermis with all these fibers here. Uh, and here's another blood vessel. Uh, so initially, you'll be bleeding into your wound right there. Second step as we move to the left, 
you're going to form a scab. So you've got all these white blood cells. All these purple splotches are going to be white blood cells that are going to help clean up bacteria. You can see some over here um, in the interstitial fluid over here, uh, as well as into this wound right here. So you're going to be cleaning up all of your um, uh, all of the debris that's all the damaged tissues here, and you're going to be closing off that wound. Third step, granulation tissue. Uh, this is a soft mass of new capillaries that are forming. Uh, macrophages, your big eaters, will remove your blood clot, and fibroblasts are going to deposit new collagen fibers to help, to help patch up um, that damaged tissue. This is going to start about three to four days after you've been injured, and it lasts about two weeks afterward. Finally, your epithelial cells will begin to multiply um, and regenerate and fill in that gap that was caused by the damage. Uh, regeneration uh, occurs very well in the epithelium and fibrosis usually occurs underneath. So in the dermis, for example, you'd see fibrosis, whereas you'll have uh, regeneration of the same cells in the epithelium above. The scab will fall away. <coughs> Uh, and tissue remod remodeling or maturation of that tissue will continue to occur uh, in the area where you have fibrosis for up to two years afterward. So here's a picture of what that looks like. You can see all of these fibers being formed here. So the lots and lots of collagen fibers here. So you see some macrophages cleaning up any debris. You still have a scab until your wound is healed. Here's your granulation tissue right here, your new capillaries that are being formed. You can see down here this blood vessel has been healed and you're no longer bleeding out. Over here is your last step. Here's your epithelial regeneration. You can see all these cells. Here's your brand new cells. Um, that was accomplished through mitosis thanks to the stratum base cell. We'll talk about that a little bit more with the integument chapter. And you've filled in this gash of cells that was missing before, now it's all filled up with new cells. You can see in this previous slide, you just have collagen fibers. And in here, you see mitosis has filled in all of those cells. Down here in the dermis, made of connective tissue, you can see you still have fibrosis. So here's your scar tissue right here. Uh, so you may not have full function of your tissue down here, but this regeneration epithelium regenerates quite well. Uh, so you'll have full function of your epidermis right here. Different tissues, as we saw just now with the epithelial uh, and the connective tissue, different tissues can have different regenerative capabilities. Generally, epithelial, bone, areolar, dense connective tissue, blood tissue, these all regenerate uh, quite well. And you'll see a uh, good function for turning to those tissues. Smooth muscle, dense regular connective tissue, uh, so smooth muscle that forms a layer of, um, of your digestive tract and um, parts of your respiratory tract, for example. Uh, dense regular connective tissue forming your tendons and ligaments. These have uh, moderate regenerative abilities. So if you tear a ligament, for example, uh, you'll be able to heal, but it, it'll take a little bit more time than what you'd see with epithelium. Cardiac muscle and nervous tissue, unfortunately, have practically no regenerative ability. So if you damage the cardiac muscle, um, so if it's damaged by a heart attack, uh, for example, and you have muscle that dies, or if you uh, are paralyzed, for example, if you have damage to your spinal cord, it's unfortunately, uh, there's very limited uh, regenerative ability, almost no regenerative ability. Uh, in tissues that do not have the ability to regenerate, fibrosis will completely replace uh, that tissue that's been wounded. That scar is not going to be very flexible, it's not going to be very elastic, uh, and you're not going to have very good function returning to that tissue. And over here you can see, uh, this is pictures of a healthy liver, and here is a liver that has cirrhosis. You can see this is scar tissue um, that has replaced the healthy liver tissue. And uh, frequently you can have cirrhosis, the scarring of the liver that occurs. Um, it, it can be due to um, too much uh, alcohol in the system. The liver um, can't process all of it and it becomes scarred tissue. So fibrosis, cirrhosis of your liver compared to your healthy liver.